we'll turn things over to Tom and uh, I can go ahead and make Tom the presenter but uh, there is one CEU credit available so there will be an attendance code uh, made available toward the end of the presentation. Tom Wolf has done a lot of research with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada looking at uh, uh, how to maximize efficacy uh, utilizing the equipment that's available for spraying and, and the different patterns that are produced by the different types of uh, nozzles that are available on, on different pieces of equipment. So we're looking forward to a very informative presentation. Well, thank you, Derwin and the Canola Council of Canada for giving me the opportunity to present to all of you this morning. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, uh, we'll be about 45 minutes for the presentation and leave as much time for question as the Canola Council wishes. Um, what we've done uh, this morning is uh, basically uh, identified what I think are the 12 most important uh, tips for uh, spraying for uh, this coming season. I've uh, identified, I think, 12 tips that I want to go through uh, in a little bit of detail and uh, keep it moving along. Um, I guess the, the classic situation that we're, we're facing is uh, this uh, dilemma, this ongoing dilemma of uh, uh, managing drift control and coverage at the same time. And this has been with us since the beginning and will continue to be with us. Uh, there are no uh, imminent solutions to this problem, uh, but we're going to try to uh, find a way of, of uh, getting as close to solution as possible. And of course, that solution uh, revolves around identifying the right spray quality for the uh, spray that we want to uh, produce. Um, the, the new way of describing spray qualities is uh, to call them in a qualitative way fine, medium coarse, very coarse, extremely coarse. We also have extremely fine and we also have ultra coarse. We're not going to talk about those today because they really have no relevance in agriculture uh, in, in the way we spray here in Western Canada. Uh, but it is important to become conversant in this uh, because the nozzle manufacturers now use that kind of terminology to describe the sprays that their nozzles produce. And we'll, uh, I'll show you some, uh, some uh, charts that the manufacturers are producing and how to interpret them. Um, the, um, the, the older way of describing a spray, which used to be uh, numerically with volume, median, diameter, uh, has been more or less um, reserved for only special cases, and that's primarily because different instruments around the world that measure these kinds of things produce different kinds of results, and there's any, not really any one number that we can hang our hat on, and the international community decided that it was more uh, uniform and less confusing to call these uh, sprays, uh, these qualitative names that, we've, that I'm showing you here. Um, I'm just going to go really right into it. Uh, the first six tips that I'm going to describe are um, relating to spray drift, and the next six tips will be relating to efficacy and coverage. And you'll see that there's going to be a few relationships there. Um, I think probably one of the, you know, I, I, it's not probably the most important tip, but I want to start off with this tip, and that is to think about the kind of mode of action that you're choosing um, and what kinds of opportunities it presents for you later. And this has to do with uh, situations you might come in, get into without uh, anticipating them at this time. And that is, it's too windy to spray, and what do you do now? and you basically are, will be forced into a situation where a low drift spray will be necessary and you will need to be able to have a mode of action that makes that possible. Um, let me just show you some examples of what different modes of action do and, and what kinds of lessons we can learn from that. Uh, for example, um, we've identified group one herbicides such as Horizon as being particularly sensitive to spray quality. And you can see in this chart here that uh, in, in this particular case I've got, um, I guess I'm just going to maybe try highlighting, um, you know what, I'll use the arrow, hold on a sec here, here we go. Uh, on this scale uh, you can see this is the, the oat control 
and on the bottom here we see spray quality and then we have water volume uh, at the bottom. And you can see that at the very core spray quality with the low water volume, our efficacy uh, clearly drops off. Um, when we increase water volume, we can get around that to some degree. Um, different different uh, products within this mode of action group uh, also uh, respond slightly differently. For example, when we go to Puma Super, we have a similar kind of response. Again, a very coarse spray at low water volume uh, it, uh, reduces efficacy somewhat. But even when we re increase the water volume to eight gallons per acre, in this case, in this case, we still have uh, a problem uh, with with uh, efficacy. And even a 12 gallon per acre doesn't completely get away from it. So th this kind of a herbicide would not be very well suited for a situation where you, you need to be able to spray with a very coarse spray for drift management purposes and so on. Uh, each, each of these group ones has different characteristics but we kind of see the trend that perhaps the coarse spray quality is possibly as coarse as we can go uh, even at the higher water volume. So this is important to know. Now mode of action is important here. Uh, for example, this is a Everest Group 2 product also on oat uh, control again. And you can see that uh, partly because there was some soil activity and, and we did have some beneficial rains uh, within a week or two after spraying, uh, we had very little sensitivity to spray quality. So we took advantage of that soil mode of action. And also Group 2 herbicides typically are somewhat less sensitive uh, to these spray quality issues. Um, so uh, in summary, when we look at the complete suite of products, um, we've identified uh, basically four different groups of herbicides that we think are extremely well suited for low drift sprays. Um, group 2s, as I mentioned, uh, um, group 4s, also very well suited. Um, uh, group 9 is quite well suited for coarser sprays. Uh, we do have to watch our interactions with water volume because we do spray glyphosate products at very low water volumes and there is a point uh, below which we, we do have a loss of droplet density, a critical loss of density where we don't actually have enough droplets uh, per square inch uh, to actually hit the weeds and so that can be an issue so we do have to watch that. And as I said, soil active products uh, absolutely uh, would work here. Um, if you uh, are prepared to go to somewhat higher water volumes, we, it does open up a whole other uh, suite of products here. Um, uh, group 1 products, uh, absolutely, and as, I, as you saw in the previous slide, 8 US gallon per acre uh, is probably the cutoff point below which we don't want to go uh, if we want to have some drift control options. Uh, the group six products are also well suited if you're prepared to go to slightly higher water volumes. Certainly group 10, uh, Liberty is, uh, is a, a, a very complicated product for us uh, because it is, it is certainly a contact product, uh, but it, it also has uh, quite a different response in grassy weeds compared to broadleaf weeds. It's a little bit more uh, uh, difficult to get good grassy weed control with Liberty. And also, it's, it tends to be sensitive to weather conditions. So, uh, you know, sunny days, for example, are important. Uh, not too dry is important. Um, the conditions, you know, pre preceding and after spraying might even be important in this case. So, uh, just having the spray quality right doesn't always give you a guarantee of good performance. Uh, group 22, um, Reglone and products like it, again, higher water volumes would be required. Uh, there's some new products. Um, there's some, some products that are probably less well suited. These are highly sensitive to, uh, to droplet size and water volume because they're very, uh, very uh, uh, contact products. So group 27, the pyrosulfatols might be in that category. Uh, that would be Velocity M3 and Infinity. And there's a whole new suite of products, uh, the group 14 products. These are not new modes of action, but they're certainly new to Canada. And we're seeing some of them tank mix now uh, with glyphosate, for example. We see that with Clean Start and Heat. Um, and then we see some Manitoba-specific products. They're not necessarily in the canola market, but they're, some of them are more soil active. These products are very contact. They're photosynthetic inhibitors, and they uh, do not respond well to coarse sprays, and they do not respond well to low water volumes. So you certainly have to be very prepared to compromise uh, when you use these products. 
just to, to show you uh, another, another way of looking at it, we did a study with uh, Rick Holm and a few other people a few years ago where we looked at the importance of herbicide rate, spray quality, and the presence of air induction uh, on uh, herbicide efficacy. And we simply counted the frequency uh, within which we saw uh, noticeable effects. Uh, so it became cl pretty clear to us that the herbicide rate was obviously the most important thing uh, to watch for, um, and you know we had 60 to 70 percent of the time we had important herbicide rate effects, but somewhat less so for group twos. Spray quality was a real eye opener for us. Uh, about half the time, uh, the group one mode of action group was sensitive to spray quality in 50 percent of our trials. But for group two, we saw less than one-fifth of the trials being sensitive to spray quality. So again, as I said, quite a forgiving mode of action. Air induction is probably not as important as we thought it was. Air induction allows us to spray low drift sprays, but we don't have to choose air induction if we have other alternatives. Uh, there are some other non-air induced low drift nozzles out there that will do, uh, by all indications, an equivalent job um, to, uh, to the air induced ones. Um, here's just an example of this uh, uh, carfentrazone uh, situation. This is uh, work Eric Johnson and I did uh, with New Farm uh, a couple of years back when we looked at Clean Start and we uh, uh, sprayed this on Rana Bredi canola and we wanted to see uh, the performance of the carfentrazone component in killing the Rana Bredi can, uh, canola. Obviously the, the Roundup component really wouldn't have any, any activity there. We saw uh, very quickly that um, we we have a um, uh, very high sensitivity uh, to, um, uh, in this case, water volume, with the higher water volume uh, really uh, doing a much better job than the lower water volumes. And this carried through over, uh, over the range of days that we had. And secondly, we looked at the, the spray quality uh, from fine, medium coarse to very coarse, and we saw a fairly strong trend uh, that the coarser we got, the, um, the less performance we had. And this, of course, is almost exactly the opposite of what, uh, what the glyphosate component Clean Start would do, as we know from our work. Uh, less water is better with glyphosate alone, and glyphosate, in fact, performs quite nicely with very coarse sprays. So a bit of a wake-up call for us there. Just looking at that glyphosate question in more detail, uh, I wanted to explain to you briefly why this is. Why, why is glyphosate uh, better with coarser sprays? And this, is, this relates back to a study that was done by a man named Feng, uh, who works for Monsanto out of St. Louis. And he sprayed two kinds of sprays. He sprayed a fine spray, which was uh, just a, a flat fan, 110015 nozzle. And he also sprayed a very coarse spray, which was an air-induced spray, uh, again, a 110015 nozzle. And they had quite different sizes, as you can see here. He measured um, the spray retention with a fine in the coarse spray, and he also measured the, uh, measured the absorption and found that with a fine spray, we certainly had more retention than we had with a very coarse spray, and that's predictable. Uh, this is on Rana Brady corn in this case. It's a difficult to wet species. Um, he didn't try to kill the corn. Obviously, he just wanted to measure how much sticks to it, and he, but he did want to measure how much was taken up, and he found that the uptake was significantly reduced when we used a fine spray compared to the very coarse spray. And when you basically multiplied these two numbers together, you found that the net benefit was greater with the very coarse spray using glyphosate than it had been for the fine spray. So traditional thoughts are, yes, you know, very coarse sprays are less well retained by our targets, but they are indeed taken up better in these large droplets with glyphosate, and as a result, we more than make up for that, that difference. And I think that was an important observation. For that reason, we're quite uh, confident that we can recommend coarser sprays for glyphosate as long as we get enough droplets per, per square inch, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, that was a pretty long tip. Uh, we're already well into our seminar. Um, the second tip I want to talk about is tip number two, to use a low drift nozzle to produce a coarse to very coarse spray. I guess the reason I use tip number one is set yourself up for tip number two. I do think that it is in the interest of our industry to, uh, to use these, uh, these low drift uh, nozzles. Um, 
these are the spray quality charts that I mentioned earlier that the manufacturers are producing. And I want to highlight, uh, I guess, some of their features. Now, this happens to be a T-Jet chart, and I don't, uh, I'm not favoring any one manufacturer, but I identified three different nozzles that they produce charts for in, on this page here. Um, and I want to just have a quick look at the blue nozzle, the uh, O3, the O3 flow rate, which is uh, identified in this number here. You can see with all nozzles, all sizes, really, as you increase your spray pressure, um, your spray quality goes from a, an extremely coarse spray down to a coarse spray. We can see, though, that if you wanted to choose a coarse to very coarse spray, you would have a certain pressure range that would be uh, best suited for this, and that begins at about 35 PSI. If you go below 35 PSI with this particular nozzle, you're producing an extremely coarse spray, which might be too coarse. You can choose other nozzles, and they also have uh, similar kinds of charts, and you can see that the threshold for hitting a coarse spray is much lower. Uh, now down to about 20 to 25 PSI for the Turbo T-Jet. And if you go to an even coarser spray than the first one, the T-Jet AI, you can see that achieving a coarse spray is, uh, you know, you have to go to very high pressures to do that. Um, this depends on your priorities. Um, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be using a very coarse spray, but you need to know what mode of action group you've got, what target you've got, what water volume you've got to make that kind of decision. Um, if you decide uh, that you ought to, you feel more comfortable with a coarse spray, then obviously these high pressures are required, and maybe a different nozzle might be a better choice for you. So um, there's a number of, and I'll just quickly go back to this, there's a number of nozzles, and I'll maybe just list them uh, verbally for you if you want to jot them down. Um, that are, I think, probably a good starting point. Um, let's start here with this, uh, with this nozzle right here. This is a low-pressure air-induced category of nozzle, and this really identifies what I think this is the sweet spot in the market. This is a nozzle that works reasonably well at reasonably low pressures, and you can certainly increase the pressure to 90 or even higher if your sprayer can do it and get that, that efficacious but still low-drift spray cloud. Comparable nozzles to the AIXR T-Jet are the Air Bubble Jet, a very well-established uh, nozzle in Western Canada, a very recommendable nozzle, similar kinds of spray quality to the AIXR, uh, similar kinds of pressure ranges. A third one is the Greenleaf Air Mix, a uh, very cost-effective nozzle, very similar again to those two. I see no real differences between these first three. Uh, the fourth one is the a fairly new one. It's called the Hypro. Guardian Air, made by Hypro uh, in the UK, uh, produces a, a good uh, uh, low drift spray, very similar to these other three. Um, produces a nice coarse spray quality over the majority of its pressure range, which is uh, a nice feature of it. We'll look in more detail at it in a few minutes. Um, there are uh, some others. Um, with the Leckler IDK nozzle, which is not as widely used as uh, is recommendable. The, uh, the tur Greenleaf Turbo Drop XL is uh, still a, a very useful nozzle. All of these nozzles can be uh, broadly categorized at least as low pressure air induced and produce very similar sprays to what we really want to have. Tip number three, uh, keep your boom low. Um, this is really a, a question of drift. Again, uh, low booms reduce drift if you you know, for, for example, in this case, have your boom at about um, you know 60 or 70 centimeters above the target. Um, you'll have half the drift if, as compared to the boom of about 90 to 100 centimeters above target. Low booms are absolutely essential and very beneficial. And the auto boom, the NORAC boom, and the the John Deere in-house version of boom height controllers have really made this possible with suspended booms. So um, I think they're well worth looking at and uh, ought, to be, ought to be used. Um, one thing to keep in mind with boom height is nozzle overlap. Um, the traditional goal has always been, and this is still recommended in many catalogs, in my opinion, uh, probably erroneously so, is a 30% overlap. And why do I not recommend that? That's because the, the edge of the fan here that sprays are usually uh, coarser droplets and the fewer droplets meets the edge of the fan on this side that sprays a similar kind of low coarse droplet number. 
and uh, you'll find that there's very few droplets really in this key overlap region. And this is particularly true with these no, new low drift nozzles. Uh, to avoid this, we are really recommending 100% overlap. And this is a, a visual thing. There's no magic number in terms of boom height. I would like you to choose a nozzle. I would like you to spray it at the pressure you expect to be spraying it with water. I would like you to look at it and make sure that the edge of the fan projects into the center of the next nozzle so that uh, the finer droplets that are in the middle here are diluted uh, by these few coarse droplets and therefore you have uniformity in terms of droplet number underneath the spray boom. Here's what I mean. Uh, the droplet density in a spray pattern follows a pattern like this. We basically have uh, large numbers of droplets in the middle, low numbers of droplets on the edge, and, and that is uh, the crux of the matter that we're really trying to uh, address here. All nozzles behave in a very similar way to this. Tip number four, um, sometimes drift is unavoidable, but uh, you ought to know what's downwind and you ought to know what harms it. Um, there are, as you know, some crops and some ecosystems that are very sensitive to drift from certain active ingredients. Uh, no, no secret there. I think it's probably wise to be fully aware of what uh, it is that you, you're spraying and what's downwind on the day that you're spraying and make sure you avoid that kind of a problem. Uh, canola is quite sensitive um, and uh, this is a slide I got from Richard Lussier uh, in the piece a few years ago and uh, you know he, he just uh, I want to illustrate some of the, the drift damage that he's, he's seen. Um, here's another one. Uh, this is sort of a low-lying area. Uh, it sort of follows patterns of, of water damage in many, uh, many times because sometimes the drift does follow the low contours of the land. This would be inversion drift that we're seeing here. Um, uh, speaking of that, I think I want to just quickly move on to tip number five, and that is to let the weather help you. Um, the weather is a very important determinant of whether uh, or not to spray. And the, uh, the traditional approach to spraying has been to, um, you know, go early morning when it's calm and try to take advantage of these low wind conditions and get your spraying done. If you look at this picture, though, you can probably see what is wrong with that approach, and that is under early morning conditions, we have temperature inversions. And temperature inversions are really situations where the spray cloud that is left behind the spray boom is not dispersed. And you can see uh, here the spray cloud is hanging behind the sprayer and uh, it is basically going to be hanging there and, uh, and uh, create problems later on. And you know, this, is a, this reminds me of a time when I was a young, young man growing up on our farm in southern Manitoba, and uh, this was in the disker days when we would harrow our fields. And, and uh, you know, sometimes we would harrow them two or three times even, and it became difficult to see where the, uh, the overlap was, where the wheel track was. And I remember uh, harrowing one day into the evening, and I noticed that the dust cloud that I generated uh, from the harrowing I just was still sitting right over the old harrow pass. So it was really easy to find my overlap and to, and to keep going. Well, this is, this is really the problem. The, the spray drift cloud also hangs for a long time, and it will eventually move. When it does move, it will be highly concentrated, and it will create a significant damage in the direction that it blows. You cannot predict uh, the direction that it's going to go in the early morning. Winds come and go. Uh, they're highly variable until the overall synoptic conditions settle in and we have, you know, the prevailing you know, westerly wind that was predicted in the weather forecast. Um, a much better choice for spraying is to choose a bright sunny day. Um, uh, you know, there, there's some wind is, is to obviously going to have to be tolerated. What happens in a bright sunny day is we have an opportunity to uh, allow the atmosphere to disperse the spray drift. And we will generate some drift, but the thermal turbulence that is now common on sunny days how rapidly dilutes it, and the downwind damage that is caused is actually quite minimal, if, if, if noticeable at all. <clears throat> Essentially what we're doing is we're sending the spray you know, up and down. We're, we're allowing it to sediment faster into the ground and we're also sending it higher up into the atmosphere to effectively dilute it. The atmosphere 
is unfortunately a, a common sink for spray drift. Um, it, I'm not sure how I feel about that, but suffice it to say that most of our pesticides are also broken down by, by sunlight and therefore perhaps the damage uh, is, is not as uh, profound as we fear. We do find um, pesticides you know, far away in some cases from where they, they've been sprayed. They always come in very, very low concentrations. Uh, it's probably more of a, a public relations issue than an actual ecological issue. Nonetheless, uh, if you need to spray uh, sunny daytime, somewhat breezy conditions are preferred. Uh, an important, um, uh, just a second here, my phone's ringing. I'll have to find a mute button. I think maybe I'll just hang it up. There we go. Um, it's really important to maintain a uh, good relationship with people who might be affected uh, before you spray. And uh, I have another uh, small story uh, from our farm where we had a, a field south of us where our neighbor needed to spray and it became extremely important uh, to, to go for him. He uh, decided to go for it even though there was a southerly wind and he used a shrouded sprayer and felt that that was good enough. And uh, he sprayed a group four product and a couple days later my mom's tomatoes were wilted and she wasn't happy about it at all and there was a bit of tension between us. You know, he was a neighbor, he was a friend, but we wished he wouldn't have done that. And I would say that if he had come into our yard and said, you know, I've, I've got a spray, um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, but uh, you, know, you know how it is, we would have said, go for it uh, and my mom would have had a chance to cover her tomatoes and everything would have been just fine. So sometimes just a, a short conversation uh, preempts any difficulties that you might have uh, later. This is becoming more and more difficult as we as our farms get larger. I remember when we had a, a neighbor uh, that came uh, into our uh, into our area who wasn't from far away and we didn't really know him and didn't know us and it became more and more difficult to communicate under those kinds of situations. So. That's important. Um, yeah, just to illustrate that point. I would say that, uh, yeah, if you have a poor relationship with someone, the, tr the, the, the risk of causing drift does increase. <laughs> okay, let's move, into, let's move into efficacy. And the point I want to make really here is that efficacy is all about timing. Um, certainly spray quality uh, matters, uh, water volume matters, but getting it done at the right time is probably the most important thing. And this is particularly true when we have to spray our fungicides. Uh, you have a, a relatively narrow window for disease control and you've got to seize it and you've got to find technologies that make that possible. Let me just show you an example of a study that uh, Eric Johnson, Sherilyn Phelps and I did a few years ago at Scott where we looked at the effect of time of removal. And we all know that it's important to spray early, but here's the take we took on. We introduced sort of an, uh, an, uh, a low drift nozzle approach. Traditionally what happens is you will take a, you know, a, tr a conventional nozzle and uh, like the, the, the fine tip here, and um, you'll compare that to uh, some kind of a low drift nozzle like an air mix or a turbo drop. In this case, this was the coarsest nozzle that we could make. And you do a side-by-side -side comparison. And for example, um, you know, maybe 17 days after spray, after uh, crop emergence, you'll see that the, the finer spray did uh, maybe had better efficacy than the uh, than the core spray, and indeed this was true. This was by far the best efficacy of all the sprays. I don't have. I'm not showing you efficacy here, and this had the lowest efficacy of all the sprays. And that, then we say, well, let's spray with a finer spray. In fact, what we wanted to show in this trial is when we. Uh, when we uh, sprayed at two different times, in reality, we often can't spray uh, when we need to spray. And if you have an extra coarse spray or a low drift spray, you were able to spray on time and therefore get uh, sort of this early removal advantage that we get with the seven days after emergence. And we had a certain yield from that. When you sprayed uh, uh, later, when the weather was better and the blood drift had been reduced and you were able to use this highly efficacious uh, nozzle, you had really missed that opportunity for early removal and you had a lower yield. So when you, uh, when you sum it all up, early removal, even with a slightly less efficacious nozzle, still gave you the highest yield and that was, uh, that's one of those advantages of using a low drift spray 
and uh, that's the, the point I want to make. Um, the a very important part of this is is to use all the tools that you're that, that are available to you. Um, if you if you have an opportunity to get an aircraft in to get the spraying done on time, by all means do that. And that's that's what they excel at. I think that's what they're here for. Uh, tip number eight. Um, I think uh, it's really important that the nozzle you choose produces a coarse spray approximately in the middle of its pressure range. Uh, this gives you the best efficacy and this gives you the most flexibility in terms of changing that spray quality when other conditions arise. Uh, for example, um, if you choose a nozzle like this, this is a, uh, this is a teach at AI, it's one of the coarsest nozzles that we have. And uh, if you use it at these low pressures here, you're probably even having a hard time producing uh, an acceptable pattern. When you do finally produce a pattern at 30 PSI, you're in an extremely coarse category. And as you increase your spray pressure, you are getting uh, into coarse eventually at 80 PSI. This is similar to the chart that I showed you a, a, a few minutes ago. And uh, this nozzle, if you want to produce a coarse spray on average, you'd have to be spraying at least at 80 psi on average. Uh, is that a good is that a good decision? Well, it's probably uh, going to be challenging for you if you need to slow down and your pressure drops uh, to maintain a coarse spray quality with this nozzle. So it might not be uh, the best decision for you. On the other hand, if you speed up and you want to uh, need to go faster, you might run out of pressure. You might only be able to produce 90 or 100 psi with your with your nozzle, and as a result of that, need to be um, uh, somewhat somewhat aware of that. Um, here is a, an example of what we want to look at. Um, if you wanted to choose a coarse spray quality on average, and let's say you were using, again, an O3 uh, nozzle here, like the Guardian Air, um, it produces a coarse spray of between about 40 and 80 PSI, and you would want to be choosing about a 60 PSI pressure uh, to, be, to be spraying on average, maybe 70 PSI. And this gives you then the flexibility of slowing down with your sprayer without leaving the coarse spray quality. It also gives you the opportunity to produce a finer spray if you would want to, uh, to get greater coverage with some contact products or just simply to speed up. So these, this, this coarse spray quality in the middle of the operating range gives you tremendous flexibility. Um, Another way, just while we're on the topic, this is the same nozzle, um, just another way of presenting the data. You'll see these charts now uh, for most manufacturers. So instead of having a table like this one that summarizes all the nozzles in one chart, um, and so we've got flow rate going from top, uh, to, uh, from the lowest flow rate to the highest flow rate, and of course, obviously these pressures. Now what we've got is individual flow rates uh, identified up here. Uh, there's a color coding that we have here and then we just go to the pressure range. And you can see this nozzle is recommended between 15 and, 115 and 115 PSI. Choose the middle of that pressure range, which is about 60 PSI. It's coarse, gives you some flexibility to move. And uh, then obviously the other flow rates are identified here. Just one note on this nozzle, the Guardian Air is the only nozzle right now that produces a, a nozzle that has an 035 flow rate. Um, that's a new flow rate. I'm not sure if that's going to be picked up by others. It just fills in a bit of a gap. But uh, always note the same kind of configuration in terms of spray quality and pressure side by side, and then these, these here flow rate uh, equations. All right, so that's really the corollary of that. Know the pressure range. Choose the middle of it. I want to expand a little bit here on what we just talked about, and that is to do with your travel speed range. I alluded to the fact that if you speed up and slow down, your pressure changes with a rate controller. This is true, um, and this is the relationship. It's not a linear relationship. When you uh, change your travel speed, uh, your spray pressure uh, increases much more dramatically. For example here, this nozzle is a turbo T-Jet. It's a 11005, and I've calibrated here in this chart for using a 10-gallon per acre application volume. You can see its pressure range is between 15 and 90 PSI. That's commonly done. Um, that's, that's read from the charts here. It's a very common pressure range. And you might think that that gives you a, a speed range between about 9 and about uh, 22 or so miles per hour. And that might be true. But the implications for a spray quality have to be considered. If you're going to these low uh, travel speeds and low pressures, you will produce an extremely coarse spray. 
Um, even if you speed up a little bit, you produce a very coarse spray. And these sprays might at best be suitable for broadleaf weeds and uh, for somewhat systemic products, and particularly at low water volumes, uh, not much more than that. Um, so you are already, you've already limited yourself with, with your travel speed that's available to you. Um, if you want to limit yourself to the coarse spray quality, which would be good for contact products, uh, grass tea, herbicides, uh, etc., lower water volumes perhaps, you've really only got between about 15 and about 20 miles per hour travel speed range available to you. Um, if you go faster than that, there's really no downside except the increased drift of risk, uh, risk of drift. These are the kinds of thoughts that I want you to have uh, in your spraying decisions, choosing nozzles where the, the coarse and perhaps the very coarse category are maximized and you minimize uh, going into the ex extremely close range for efficacy reasons. Um, uh, while we're on the topic of pressure range, the, you, you always have these options of, of choosing a high pressure nozzle or a low pressure nozzle. And um, the market is more or less decided on the low pressure version uh, for the following reasons. Um, the high pressure nozzle in this example uh, wouldn't be recommended to go below a 60 psi pressure and maybe up to 100 psi or so. Uh, if you choose about an 80 psi middle point here, you have a, tr a pressure range or a travel speed range of only 29%. So you can really only go as low as about 16 or 17 miles an hour and maybe as high as 22 miles per hour in this, this example. But if you choose a low pressure nozzle that has the same kind of pressure range, 40 psi, and you start that PSI range at about 20 PSI and end it at about 60 PSI, uh, you've given yourself a 73% travel speed range from about 12 miles per hour back up to about the 22 miles per hour that you wanted. So you've gained this kind of travel speed range by having a low pressure type nozzle. There's really nothing stopping you from extending this a little bit up and maybe going down a little bit here with the caveats I've already identified for spray quality. Um, but that's, that's really all. Tip number 10, so this is really not uh, necessarily an efficacy tip, but I, I, do, want you, uh, to th I do want you to think about uh, speed uh, as not the only solution uh, for greater productivity. We're being bombarded by um, marketing of new sprayers uh, trying to sell you horsepower, uh, capacity, speed, um, tank size, um, you know, smooth riding suspension systems, and this can lead to other kinds of problems. Um, we know that weight requires structural strength and horsepower, and this does give you more weight, you know. Um, Basically, it's a, you get yourself into a situation that's difficult to get, get out of. You've got more wheel tracks, and there's soft conditions, you're limited. You certainly have larger tractor units that have poor aerodynamic characteristics, and we know about spray deposition behind the boom. Um, I think that lighter units do have a place in our, in our world. They have certainly a loss of capacity, but I do believe that the greater range of conditions over, under which they can operate might have some advantages. Um, I, th I think uh, you know this, these, this weight uh, is offset somewhat, uh, maybe by the loss of four-wheel drive in this particular model. But it is a lighter unit and uh, might be a little bit more practical under soft conditions. Let's say. Think about things like uh, filling time. Um, you know, on our farm, we always made a point uh, when combining of unloading on the go if conditions permitted, because we felt that uh, we saved possibly as much as 20% of our combining time by not stopping. And the, one of the criteria for combines uh, that we bought was fast unloading order speed. And we want to minimize the downtime, non-productive downtime. Similar kinds of principles can be applied in spraying, um, filling up quickly, uh, looking at your pump capacity, uh, convenience, uh, reliability of the gauges, visibility. These are all uh, factors that will help you fill up more efficiently. And instead of taking 20 or 25 minutes to fill that tank and, and fill, you know, recharge everything and make sure everything's good, Optimize that, shave 10 minutes off that process, and you save yourself some significant time. Look at sprayers, uh, look at the, the loading area, um, what kinds of uh, features they have and how easy it is to use them. A large three inch inlet in this case, this is an induction unit that it actually swings down low at a waist height, very easy to use. All the 
uh, levers are here. There's other other versions of it here. Just swung down. Here's another one: induction and all the levers for rinsing and agitating all at your fingertips. Just increases the efficiency of the operation. Um, boom width. You know, I joke about this. I do think boom width is underutilized. Uh, you know, we go to Europe to to conferences and visit farms, and we see. Uh, French farms, for example, um, having as wide a boom on their spurs as our Canadian farms, and um, you know France has large tracts of land too, uh, but we we certainly still have larger ones, and I think we're not utilizing um, the boom width issue as much as we could. I, I would want to just look at some of these issues here. If, if you, for example, um, went from about 15 miles an hour to 20 miles an hour, just as an increase in productivity, that's a 33% advantage, but you create problems, dust tracks, pressure fluctuations that become more severe. Um, if you go from a 90 to 120 foot boom, you've also got yourself uh, a 33% advantage without the advantage of this, uh, disadvantage of the speed. You do have to watch your boom height. You probably need auto boom height control. You need to make sure you've got flow capacity in your in your pump system and so forth. Pressure drop issues become important, but uh, probably easier to deal with. Going from 20 to 15 minutes fill time is a 25% increase uh, uh, or change here, and um, we uh, we have this. Um, uh, some issues there. Spare nozzles, even a little thing like having um, uh, extra nozzles to minimize the downtime when you have a plug is important. Low drift tip uh, tips allowing you to keep spraying and matching droplet size, um, I, I think should be should be part of that productivity question. All right, second last tip. Um, this is a, a tough one because it requires a lot of a lot of you know, integrated knowledge. Uh, selecting water volume and spray quality based on target and pesticide characteristics. A very common question I get is, what's the right water volume, uh, you know, for this tip, or what's the right spray quality for this pesticide? And, you know, um, what about weather conditions? What about cropping situations? It becomes a very complicated uh, situation, but I want to introduce just a few principles to you. First of all, if you're targeting grassy weeds, these are our most difficult targets. They're difficult because they have more uh, vertical kind of orientations typically. They can have very small targets attached to them. They can be very difficult to wet. Uh, droplets will tend to bounce off them, larger droplets in particular. These are the kinds of targets that will require finer sprays. This is where you try to avoid very coarse, make sure you stay in course. Um, this is also where the uh, uh, targets require slightly higher water volumes to get uh, some of these difficult targets covered, and this is the group one experience. Broadleaf weeds, on the other hand, particularly the easy to wet ones like these ones, are more forgiving, and they will tolerate larger droplets, and you can easily go from a coarse to a very coarse spray quality, even while reducing your water volume somewhat uh, under some conditions. This is particularly true with our systemic modes of action, which is really the other thing to remember. Um, so uh, look at the mode of a look at the the target first. Mode of action is your second thing. Are you doing contacts? Are you doing systemics? Uh, very very important to to think about. Uh, what's the dependence of of, of weather uh, on the mode of a uh, on the activity of these these modes of action? It's also very important. Sometimes we have in between products. So we have uh, you know kosher cleavers, Russian thistle that are you know broadleaf targets but difficult to wet, maybe small leaves, difficult to target leaves, look at them and have a, make a decision based on, on their orientation. If you're unfamiliar with a new weed and you want to make sure you don't make a mistake on the droplet size front, a very simple test is to simply uh, pour some water on that weed. Just in the field, if you have water handy, a spray bottle or a water bottle, doesn't matter, pour some water on it and see if it gets wet and stays wet. Look if the water droplets beat up on it. If you see a good thorough wetting, like you would see with a round leaf mallow or a cotyledon stage volunteer canola plant uh, or a, a red root pigweed, um, you really won't have a droplet size issue because these weeds have easy to wet surfaces and therefore will uh, take to large droplets nicely. If the water beads, runs off, and you can't wet it, and this would be what happens to kosher cleavers, Russian thistle, lamb's quarters is another one. Certainly, most of the grassy weeds that we have, you have you've got to be careful with that. So that's an important issue. Another one really has to do with canopy density, 
And uh, we do have some very dense canopies under some conditions. And if you need to get through that canopy, you've got a large leaf area index to go through. And the only way really to get through those canopies is to do it with more water and slower travel speed. Droplet size matters to some degree, but water volume and travel speed are much more important. It's going to be tough to get through this canopy. I mean, just look at it. Um, if you need to just get the flag leaf of this wheat crop, um, you're home free. It doesn't really matter because the, the target is at the top of the canopy. But if you're looking for migrating tan spot or septoria coming up from the bottom, um, you need to get through that better and that becomes a consideration for water volume and droplet size. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that you need to think about um, when, you're, when you're out there. A very useful tool is water sensitive paper. Uh, it's no substitute for looking at spray quality because really you're, all you're doing is really qualitative assessment. But uh, we do want to avoid these areas where we have extremely coarse sprays and low water volumes. Don't go there. Uh, migrate over to a little bit more water, a little bit finer sprays uh, as permitted by spray drift. Last tip. Uh, don't let double nozzles confuse you. And I get a lot of calls on double nozzles, and I think they're a good thing. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, perceptions about how they work and what they do and the magic that they perform that we probably need to set straight. Um, double nozzles are coming in a lot of different shapes. This is a German one that we've got uh, in, in the market now, and Greenleaf has been a real leader in bringing these nozzles in. This is a, what they call a high-speed kind of nozzle where they say, you know, we've only got a 10 degree deflection here and a 50 degree deflection and you, you'd be traveling, you know, in this, in this direction from left to right and you would sort of, you know, take advantage of the fact that the spray is actually redirected somewhat at high travel speeds in terms of its trajectory and the backside needs to be, you know, wetting the vertical targets. And there's a lot of talk about how this is all advantageous and that might be true, uh, but I think the, it's, it's probably somewhat oversold. Um, when we did Liberty on Wild Oat a few years ago, this is again a work with Eric Johnson and Scott, we found very little benefit from going to a double nozzle in terms of our, our Wild Oat control with Liberty. Uh, we saw perhaps when we had a quite coarse spray with a twin cap, uh, we saw a slightly reduced performance. And this was probably because the spray was so coarse. It had... Um, and this was surprising, you know, it, it happened with a, with a twin. Uh, but again, as I said, it was probably a coarseness issue rather than a, a double nozzle issue. Um, we did see in, in one case here uh, when we had a half rate, oops, uh, we saw less, uh, less performance with a single nozzle compared to a double nozzle. But most of the time at the full rate with a finer spray or a coarser spray, the differences were really not statistically significant. We very often see this. The benefit of the double nozzle is probably slightly oversold, and it probably is actually uh, a benefit that we most realize in the fungicide world. When the canopy, the target is at the top of the canopy and the direction of the spray matters for getting it onto that target, maybe it's a vertical target, a double nozzle will help you. If you're just simply trying to do regular herbicide work and uh, the target is a little bit less confused, uh, you know, it's vertical, it's deeper down, it's, it's got a lot of different features, a double nozzle will probably not be magic. Nozzle angle will be, though, at the top of the canopy. So uh, this is where spray quality comes in. So what we did here is we looked at a 60 degree backward, 30 degree backward, a vertical uh, 30 degree forward and 60 degree forward uh, with a relatively fine spray. And we found not so much effect, really. We saw the vertical wasn't quite as good as the angles. When we went, though, to a, a low drift nozzle here, this is an air bubble jet, we saw a pretty strong response to angling that tip and found that uh, the, the vertical orientation was least good, but the forward angling was best. And we decided to follow up on that. And what we found was that this benefit of angling the nozzle forward was very strong at the low boom heights. We did three boom heights here. All these are angled forward. We, we tested it just on these artificial targets here. And we found that when we had a high boom, um, the, the forward angled sprays did not do as well as when we had a low boom. When, when we had a low boom, uh, notice that the coarser sprays did better. And that's because the angling is easier to be, uh, you know, easier to maintain, I guess, in the forward uh, trajectory when we uh, when we do that. So, um, I guess to summarize, um, I think having a low boom is important for drift reasons. It's also important if you want to have an angled spray. If you have a high boom and an angled spray, you're probably not getting a lot of benefit out of the angling. Um, I think if you are going to angle. 
go, f go forward. Uh, I think we saw best performance for grasses. Uh, backwards might give you some canopy penetration advantages because the, the, the spray will be moving more downward in the net, in the, in, in, in the net result. Uh, as I showed you, the greatest effect is with coarse sprays and low booms, very, very important. So I'll give you some suggestions now to, uh, to close off the webinar. Um, I think it's important that we pick nozzles with wide pressure ranges. Um, and I don't really care whether that pressure range is at the low end or the high end. Uh, you probably will get more bang for the buck with a, with a wide pressure range that extends into the low end because you get more travel speed out of that kind of a, a situation. Um, this is important. Um, you ought to know the pressure range of, of the nozzle that you already have. Let's say you're not picking a new nozzle, you've got one. Do some research, read the fine print on the nozzle, go online, get, a, get an online catalog. They're out there. Um, T-Jet has them, Hypo has them, Greenleaf has them, uh, John Deere has them. They're all out there. Know what you're producing. Also, no matter what nozzle you buy, do not believe the actual um, pressure ranges that are printed in the catalog and don't believe the fan angles that are printed in the catalog because they're difficult to pin down. You need to actually know the spray pattern at your pressure extremes by visually inspecting them. Spray water through your boom, put the boom at a low pressure and look at the spray pattern that you're getting and see is that good enough? Am I getting the 100% overlap that we need? Increase the spray pressure. Uh, and see what, what the effect of that is. is. It's the only way to really do it. Um, across that spray pressure that you need to use, know the spray quality. So you know if you go to a low travel speed and therefore a low spray pressure, there are spray quality or spray efficacy implications for that. You need to be fully aware of those. Um, test the pressure capability of your sprayer. You know, we've talked a lot about going high pressure with these, with these low drift nozzles. <clears throat> they still are low drift at high pressures, but if you can't produce a pressure above 80 PSI, uh, you may need to pick a very specific nozzle that doesn't require you to go that high. Um, so make sure your pressure can, your sprayer can do it. Uh, test these kinds of capabilities at high flow rates. That's when the pumps are most challenged. So put a large nozzle in there before you make that test. On the whole, select a coarse spray quality. I think that's our, our, our bread and butter. Make adjustments uh, to it for drift issues, for systemic issues. You can go to cor uh, coarser nozzles than that. For uh, finer, a more sensitive products, uh, go to a medium spray quality with pressure. Um, if you're looking at some of the Wilger uh, products, this means a VMD, a volume in diameter between 350 and 450 microns is your target. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank you again for, uh, for being with us this morning and I'll turn it back over uh, to Derwin for the questions. Great. Uh Thanks very much uh, for that, Tom. I think uh, you've done a great job of covering some of uh, some of the key uh, key issues and uh, really delivered what we wanted to deliver to the audience, uh, recognizing some of the challenging conditions. As I look out the window at the lightning and the rain starting to fall again, windows for application are going to be uh, sometimes small this year, and and and. Uh, with lots of the products having some recommendations around the spray quality to get that best balance between uh, a reduced risk of drift and, and good efficacy. Uh, I, I think the, these tips are quite timely in terms of how to do, do that with whatever uh, particular tips a, a producer or an applicator is working with. Um, we do have a handful of questions here, so I'll just get going on those. Uh, the first question early in the presentation was, uh, what's your experience and opinion of AIM command spray nozzles? Okay, uh, can, you, can you hear me okay? Yep, you're coming okay. loud and clear. Excellent. Uh, for those of you who don't know AIM command, I'll start with a brief uh, uh, description of it. Um, AIM command is a new way of controlling the flow of your sprayer. The traditional way, as we talked about earlier uh, this morning, is 
to uh, change this spray pressure to increase flow. The problem with that approach is that in order to double your flow, you have to quadruple your pressure. <clears throat> in other words, you don't get a lot of bang for the buck out of changing pressure, and that's the reason, really, why our travel speed ranges are so limited with these conventional nozzles. The AIM command system uses a different approach. It says, we will no longer rely on pressure to change our flow. We have a pulsing solenoid that does that for us, and we control the flow through something called pulse width modulation. In other words, we have electronic control over the proportion of the time that that nozzle is on and the proportion of the time that that nozzle is off. So now I can have a pulsing solenoid at each nozzle. It pulses at 10 hertz, 10 times per second. That's faster than then would have any impact whatsoever on the coverage of the, of the canopy below that. And if you want to have high flow, you simply uh, have a high duty cycle, uh, maybe even full on. If you want a low flow, all you do is reduce the duty cycle, which means the proportion of time that the nozzle is off is increased. This change has no effect on the spray pressure. It has no effect on the uh, droplet size that the nozzle produces. In other words, now you have pretty wide travel speed ranges without any of the negative downsides of the conventional uh, rate controller. Um, <clears throat> the system has been around for about 10 or more years now. Uh, it, is, it has sold several thousand copies in Western Canada. Saskatchewan in particular is the high rate of adoption of it uh, in the world. Um, and it's coming back with some pretty good reviews. I would say um, the average user that's bought into it is, is appreciative of the fact that no more pressure change with travel speed change. Um, there's, a, uh, I think, very good uh, uh, support now that there's more experience with it with, by the dealers in terms of technical support. It is an electronic control. Uh, wire wiggling is part of that. Uh, so there's <laughs> some some nervousness uh, there. From what I've heard, um, good results, uh, happy customers. Certainly, we use it in our research, so I do I do experience it firsthand. Um, I would say some of the bigger challenges with AIM Command are choosing the right nozzle for it because you can't use an air-induced nozzle, and you typically will use a fairly high flow rate nozzle because you will ordinarily be operating it at a 60% duty cycle, so you're choking back the flow, so the nozzle you're choosing is now 40% larger than it would ordinarily be. That gives that has a few implications for spray quality, so there's online tools for that to help with that. But on the whole, a very clever, innovative way of getting, uh, getting the rate control better. I want to just, you know, just comment on the cost. Um, that might be a follow-up question. Um, I think depending on the size of your sprayer and the relationship you have and the trade in you're bringing and so forth, you should expect to pay between uh, eighteen and $22,000 or something like that for a 90-foot boom. Okay, great. Thanks, Tom. Uh, right. the, the next question was uh, with regard to if you're spraying fertilizers with your herbicide, any any considerations as far as tips that are better for that? Yeah, that's a, that's something we don't have a lot of experience with. I mean, uh, I'm assuming that the question relates uh, not obviously to the compatibility, but the spraying of it. I mean, if you spray a, a fertilizer, a liquid fertilizer 2800 onto your crop, I mean, obviously it's going to uh, burned a little bit, and uh, I think that uh, uh, that's one of the reasons that everyone's going to these uh, these straight stream nozzles uh, to try to avoid that and go more of a, do more of a banding approach. Um, I I don't have a research knowledge of the implications. You know, if you have the burn, what is the implication for uptake of herbicide? Um, I would say it's more likely to be negative than positive in all likelihood. Um, but fertilizers can also be uh, water conditioners and be synergists for her, some herbicides. So probably a mixed bag. Um, I wish I could answer it better. All right. Thank, thanks, Tom. Uh, then we have a couple of questions from Jason. The first one, and uh, uh, the question was asked before you got into the discussion of uh, nozzle angles, but uh, so you may have answered part of it already, but uh, he was specifically asking about the air induction nozzles and uh, should they be tipped angled forward or back? 
It's a good question, and I don't mind going over that again because it is it is something where we have to consider a number of things. So there's really two schools of thought out there that are um, that are out there. There is the 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 traditional research data show that angling your nozzle forward is advantageous for coverage of weeds and particularly vertical weeds like grassy weeds. Um, it's also advantageous for covering stems or weed heads or anything that you're trying to get that is more or less vertical. Um, so, and, and the other school of thought out there is, is quite local and it revolves around um, a, a consultant working out of Lethbridge who, uh, uh, his name's Gary Moffat, and he does a lot of pattern testing with sprayers in you know while they're moving and he has found with his work that actually he gets better patternation when he angles the nozzles backwards this has to do with aerodynamics and sort of the you know minimizing the interference of sprayer boom components wheels tractor units and so forth now spray uniformity is key and and uh, we want to make sure we get that um, I would say an angle on the whole is probably better than not an angle, <laughs> but uh, I'm probably less uh, convinced that we have to go forward or have to go backward um, there's, it, because of this different uh, school of thought. But I, I want to make one last point, and that has to do with what we said about uh, spray quality and boom height. Angling your nozzle is prov angling your nozzle forward probably has no advantage whatsoever if your boom is too high. By the time that spray hits the canopy, it is no longer moving forward. Therefore, angling your nozzles backward probably you realize the benefit of the advantage of the added uniformity, and maybe uh, some residual benefit from the angle, although probably minor. Um, and sometimes I joke, you know, I say, well, since I can't decide between forward angling and backward angling, why not angle them forward and backward? And then we're recommending the double nozzle, aren't we? So, <laughs> um, you know, let's let's just quickly go there. The, the double nozzle, um, I think, has shown some merit, some real strong merit in the fungicide world, particularly fusarium head blight in those areas. Um, it has shown a lot less merit efficacy-wise in the herbicide world. However, what is the downside of it? Uh, really just a couple, as far as I can tell. The first one is it's more expensive to buy. Um, you know, you might be spending double the money or three times the money for a unit. Still a relative bargain in the nozzle world. And the, the second downside really has to do with, uh, with increased plugging potential. Um, and so, you know, just a little bit more maintenance on these nozzles. But you might be in a position to take advantage of the rare events, albeit rare, that uh, where you get better uh, uh, performance. And so, why why not go there? I, I don't have a strong uh, negative opinion about that. I just want to make sure that I don't t I recommend that you spend thirty dollars a nozzle and then you say, well, everything still works the, s the same way it did before, because that's the likely outcome of it. Um, but there there's my answer. Great. Um, and the next question uh, was from Jack, and he was wondering, you showed some really thick canopies, uh, some pictures of really thick canopies. And so his question was, uh, on that thick canopy, is a finer droplet better than coarse, and is it better at a slower speed? Um, kind of getting to what's that ideal spraying speed that some comment that 15 miles an hour is too fast. That's an excellent question. Thanks for that. It's uh, it's um, it's something that um, it, there is no single right answer. But let let me go there with you. The the dense canopy I showed um, was obviously an extreme situation. But um, you have to ask yourself, what are you trying to accomplish with your spray? If you are uh, spraying a fungicide and you and you're spraying to protect the, the the flag leaf, you're you're good with just about any spray and just about any travel speed and just about any water volume, because the leaf area index of the flag leaf in that canopy is well not the leaf area index but you know it's it's an open it's an open presentation. The spray will arrive at the flag leaf and it will. There's nothing in between the sprayer and the flag leaf. If on the other hand you're trying to get through that canopy, um, it becomes very complicated. Number one. 
as I said, slow travel speed and more water is probably your single most effective tool of getting through a canopy like that. But let's go to the water, let's go to the droplet size question. Should you be using a, a coarser or a finer spray? It, it depends to some degree. A coarse droplet will tend to go past vertical targets. It'll tend to go past stems. It'll tend to go through to the first horizontal thing it sees. And hopefully that'll be a leaf in the lower end of the canopy. Um, if you have horizontal targets at the top of the canopy, like, you know, a canola, that's close to closure, uh, canopy closure, um, you're going to intercept just about every coarse droplet that you're going to present to that canopy. In order to get around that, inter that, that obstacle, the only way to do it is really by using a finer droplet, and that typically will move around those, those, those uh, interfering targets and, and go deeper into the canopy. On the other hand, now, if the canopy is, is complicated, it's, it's finely divided leaves or stems and, and a lot of different things going in different directions, not a lot of large targets, those are the kinds of targets that capture fine droplets. And as a result of that, you'll probably not make, the fine spray will probably not go very deep into that canopy. So that's a, that's a serious, uh, serious consideration. Let's face it, there isn't a magic uh, spray quality that's going to meet all of your needs. Um, fortunately, the hydraulic nozzles produce a wide range of droplet sizes. Every single nozzle that you can buy produces some fines and some courses, and most of it will be in the middle. The proportion of the volume that is in those fines and courses is under your control. It's, uh, it's controlled by nozzle selection and by pressure selection. If you feel that uh, given the canopy that you've got that you need a little bit full more fine droplets, increase your spray pressure. Uh, those are the tools. Um, angling of nozzles might come into that even as well. Um, it's possible that some you know, angled large droplets might, might go a little deeper into the canopy. We haven't seen much evidence of that in the fungicide world, um, but um, probably, probably could, uh, could, there could be some benefit. I hope that, I hope that answers it. It's, it's, a, it's a good question because it really integrates everything we've talked about. Um, and what I want you to do is to look at your canopy critically and say, where does the spray need to go and what's in its way? And then choose your spray. Great comment, Tom. Um, next, we had, we had a couple of questions on this particular, uh, the very target nozzles. Um, and the one question was specific to uh, using the, the yellow medium uh, nozzle for a product like Liberty. But there were a couple of questions just about what your thoughts are on the very target nozzles. Okay, and I'll, I'll approach it the same way to the AIM command, and that is uh, just to give those who are not familiar with that nozzle a, a bit of background on it. The very target nozzle is essentially a counterpart to the AIM command in that it addresses the issue of flow control in a nozzle with pressure and the inadequacy of the current system. The very target uses a different approach, though. It, it uses a variable size orifice that, is, that you can open or close with a plunger system that is basically engaged by pressure. In other words, now, when you increase the spray pressure, the, a plunger in, in the nozzle pushes down on a flexible exit tip. And that flexible tip opens up slightly and allows more liquid to go through. So even if you hadn't increased the pressure, the flow rate of that nozzle would have increased. What that really means now is you have a tremendous flow rate range over a fairly narrow pressure range. So basically now you can do, with any one nozzle now, you can produce low travel speed, low water volume flows, as well as high travel speed, high water volume flows with one tip. Now, the question was particular to the yellow cap that's on that, that very target nozzle. So here's a, here's a, a different color coding scheme uh, compared to the regular nozzles. As you know, flow rates are color coded. Green is 015, yellow is 02, blue is 03, etc. In the very target world, they use a spray quality color coding system. In other words, because that nozzle produces a wide range of flow rates, the yellow doesn't mean O2, it means medium spray. If you want to have a coarse spray, that would be the blue tip. If you want to have a very coarse spray, that would be the green tip, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, just getting to these a different color coding, we didn't get into that in the seminar. So the question is, should I use a very target 
if I use a very target with liberty, is the yellow tip uh, the most suitable tip? While the yellow tip certainly produces the medium spray, Liberty would probably benefit to some degree from a, a finer spray because it's contact and because the, the grassy control side of it needs a bit of assistance and fine droplets offer that. Uh, so the answer is yes, uh, absolutely. The yellow tip is the right one for Liberty. Uh, I would say not at the um, uh, exclusion of um, uh, the, 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 blue, the blue exit tip, which produces a coarser spray. Liberty will still work well with that also. More importantly for Liberty probably is water volume. Um, we're talking, you know, the label is quite discreet. It says 10 imperial gallons, please. You know, and I think there's good research behind that recommendation. You'll always find people who say less water worked for me, but a lot of other things may have come into play. I would, I would really stick to the, the label recommendation for Liberty on the water volume. Before I leave the very target, I just want to make one comment on it, and that is we have worked with it, it works. Um, we have some concerns, and here they are. The very target, the, it's, it's difficult with the very target to produce an exact flow rate at any given pressure. And that's because it's a little more complicated. You know, you've got a spring in there, you've got a plunger, you've got a nozzle cap. Things have to be lined up properly for the plunger to properly interact with the nozzle cap and give the right amount of de uh, deformation. Why is, this, why is this a concern? It's a concern because we've observed that, that nozzles sitting side by side on the spray boom sometimes offer pretty different flows. And that may not always be a problem, but it can, if it is a problem, you may see it. And we're talking about flows that differ as much as 25 to 30 percent from the next adjacent nozzle or a nozzle a little bit further down the boom. If you use the very target nozzle, make sure your flows are good. Make sure you adjust the, the cap pressure, uh, that uh, adjust the spring pressure, et cetera, et cetera. These are issues that need to be dealt with before you, uh, you buy into that technology. Uh, that was a bit long-winded, but I hope useful. Great. Uh, I think we're getting to the end uh, here. There's a number of other questions, but they're fairly general, and, and uh, I'll maybe uh, we'll be passing along the questions to Tom after the after the webinar, and uh, he's indicated that he's uh, more than willing to try and address uh, any questions we didn't get a chance to cover. Maybe to wrap things up, we had two or three questions here. Um, and they all kind of are around the topic of uh, uh, drift and, and minimizing drift and just questions around uh, the trade-offs between uh, uh, boom height, water volume, and uh, nozzle selection in terms of, I guess, what's, what's the best trade-off. And, and I guess the other one is, is speed of travel and uh, you know, trying to get the most out of, <laughs> most capacity out of your sprayer, but at the same time minimizing drift. So what are the best trade-offs to make in that regard? Okay, that's a, a very good question because again, it, uh, it asks us to sort of go back to what we talked about and integrate uh, everything that, we, that, that happens. And of course, the spraying situation is, is complicated. Number one thing that you should do if you want to minimize drift is get yourself a low drift nozzle. Uh, far, far and away the most single most effective investment that you can make. Get yourself a low pressure air induced tip. Operate in the middle of the pressure range about 60 psi. You will reduce your drift compared to a conventional flat fan by 70%, give or take. Uh, don't forget the Wilger nozzle line. They're not air induced. Um, these are the Wilger SR, MR, and DR nozzles. They are essentially equivalent to air induced nozzles. The SR, MR, and DR differ uh, in, in how low drift they are. SR being uh, least low drift and DR being most low drift. Uh, the SR is an excellent compromise nozzle that compares very favorably to the low pressure air induction as does the MR. So um, that's number one. Uh, next thing is, is boom height. 
uh, boom height has been shown in studies over and over again to be very important uh, for minimizing drift. I would lower my boom as much as I could while maintaining 100% overlap. That's the message I gave you earlier. Get an auto boom height controller if you don't have one. When I used to operate a sprayer, <clears throat> I would spend half my time looking out the back and making sure half of the boom wasn't in the ground and the other half 10 feet in the air. And you know that uh, that these auto boom levelers are so valuable for taking that uh, that uh, out of the equation. Um, the, the, the other two factors are volume and speed. Um, water volume per se doesn't affect spray drift, um, but it does indirectly because if you use more water, you will probably use a larger nozzle. Well, a larger nozzle probably will make a coarser spray because when you go up in nozzle size, that's what happens. So more water probably will reduce your spray drift. Another neat thing about low water volume, uh, higher water volume is that the drift, you know, the spray tank has a more dilute concentration of herbicide in it. So the drift that does occur is somewhat less potent. So, you know, bit of a bit of a benefit. Travel speed. And this is this is the one that I think is plaguing us the most. The the need for speed in the industry. Hitting the window of opportunity, uh, timing it properly and just getting the acres done with the limited time that we have. I, I am not happy about to asking you to travel slower. Someone mentioned 15 miles per hour being an ideal speed. It's not ideal. You know, five is ideal, but it's ridiculous to go five. So 15 is the number that I've put out there as being sort of, you know, it, it gives my, I give it my, my approval while my teeth are gritted, you know. Um, I, I think we minimize the downsides of increased travel speed at about 15. 2022 is simply too fast to do. Other issues become very important. Drift certainly will increase. Aerodynamics, all kinds of reasons for that. Um, uniformity will, will decrease. Tracks, dust, all these things will increase and we just don't want to go there. So um, I think low speed is beneficial for a quality job. I would say this, um, not every day is the same when you get up in the morning. Some days you might not have to do a thousand acres of spring and maybe those are the days when you can slow down, take it easy, put in a lower flow nozzle and, uh, and do, do the quality job that's necessary. Great. Well, I, I think that uh, we'll wrap things up there, Tom. want to thank you very much for all your insights today. I think that was a great question to wrap up on because it really is about integrating all those pieces of information to do the best job you can with the particular equipment you're working with.